There is no man in America who understands the Internal Revenue Code. Agents of the IRS do not, judges do not, congressmen do not, and most assuredly taxpayers do not. There are over a thousand pages of technical language, much of which is vague or self-contradictory, giving rise to hundreds of thousands of pages of treasury rulings, court opinions, private letter rulings, and professional analysis. The Prentice Hall Federal Tax Library alone contains over 50 volumes with hundreds of new pages released each month. And yet, the least educated person is expected to comply with its provisions because ignorance of the law is no excuse. The income tax code is complex because it is supposed to be complex. It is unfair because it is designed to be unfair. It cannot serve its primary purpose any other way. Warning, you are about to enter the reality zone, a place where truth is stranger than fiction, where knowledge is keen, where myths are shattered and deceptions exposed. It's a place where the lessons of history are found and where true life adventures reveal the hidden nature of man. If you proceed, you will not be able to return to the twilight zone from which you came. You have five seconds remaining to escape. Welcome to the Reality Zone. I'm Ed Griffin. The subject of this program is taxes. It seems that no one is happy with taxes the way they are. Taxpayers certainly don't like them, but politicians also say that they are dissatisfied with them and are forever making proposals for reform. Yet, with each passing year, and with each new so-called tax reform legislation, the taxes get bigger, more complicated, and more burdensome. The ambitious goal of this program is to explain why that is, and then to offer a proposal which really would be tax reform. Now, what you are about to hear is an address I delivered at a banquet dinner of the Council of the John Burt Society held in Dallas, Texas. There's not a lot I can say about this talk by way of introduction without repeating what will come in due course. I can tell you, however, that you're likely to find some surprises in its content. And so here it is, as recorded on May 18, 1996, The Perfect Tax. Well, thank you, Jack. And thank you, members of the council and ladies and gentlemen. When I was told that I had about 30 minutes to make my presentation tonight, I thought, oh, that's just about right for a topic like this. And so I started putting together my notes, and uh, I mumbled from these notes the other night, put the watch on it, and when I was all done, I was appalled to find that I had mumbled for over an hour. And uh, there was a whole string of things on a piece of paper which I hadn't yet incorporated into the outline. So uh, I panicked. But how on earth am I going to cut this way down to 30 minutes or so? And I thought, it can't be done. And then I got an idea. I remembered when we go out on these lecture tours, every once in a while you run into some energetic radio or TV reporter, and they want to uh, put you on the news. But they tell you right up front they don't have a lot of time. They're certainly not going to sit through your one-hour lecture. And they tell you they've got 30 seconds at the most. Say it in 30 seconds. And then they say, however, 10 seconds would be better. So uh, you get to be pretty good at condensing these one-hour lectures into 10 seconds. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to condense this whole ball of wax down to 10 seconds. And that's what I have done. In fact, I've even broken that 10 seconds into two parts. <laughs> the first part will take five seconds, and the second part will take five seconds. So, here is part one. Taxes are too high and I'm against them. Any questions? <laughs> exactly about four seconds. Okay, now having delivered the main body of my presentation, for those of you who have a little extra time, 
I'd like to deal with some of the lesser points. And we'll come to the second five-second summary toward the end of this whole thing. Of course, there is a great deal of interest today in tax reform. I mean, you hear it being spoken by our candidates quite a bit. That's because I think Americans are finally fed up with this thing called the income tax. And so we find the candidates, especially those for president, running down to the head of the line of the parade, and they are all giving us speeches and giving us programs and proposals for tax reform. Especially, they're all again the income tax. And for very good reasons, too, I might add. However, I'd like to mention a few of those reasons which perhaps some of the candidates are not discussing. The income tax was originally sold to the American people as an act of envy and revenge against the very wealthy, the wealthy class. The rich, at long last, they were told, were supposedly going to be forced to pay their fair share and more. That was the justice part. Now, in the House of Representatives, Congressman Thomas J. Hudson of Kansas more or less expressed the prevailing sentiment when he said this, I know that many wealthy men are generous and charitable. On the other hand, the majority of the very wealthy are haughty, overbearing, autocratic, mean. And it is that class in particular that the income tax is designed to reach." End quote. Well, how ironic it was that the same politicians who were promoting the income tax as a means of soaking the rich came from some of the wealthiest families in the world. And of course, I'm talking about such men as Senator Nelson Aldridge, who was a business associate of J.P. Morgan and father-in-law to John D. Rockefeller, Jr. He was one of the main promoters of the whole income tax proposal. Now, little did the voters realize that in their desire to shift the tax load from themselves to the very rich, they were in effect actually doing the same thing to themselves, not to the very rich. The middle class literally was tricked into clamoring for its own extinction. Now, in the same year that the income tax was adopted, Congress also created the Tax-Exempt Foundation, and that, too, was sponsored by Senator Aldridge and the same financial elite who had sponsored the income tax and, I might also add, the Federal Reserve System. Now, why do you suppose they did that? Everyone thinks that they made a huge mistake. Well. Not as it turns out. The tax-exempt foundation, as we now know with many years of experience, is a device which appears to be charitable, but which is really designed to enable family dynasties with great wealth to avoid paying either income or inheritance taxes. Now that scheme involves two steps. First, the donor very carefully picks managers and directors of the foundation who are financially beholden to him or to one of his commercial enterprises. These people also are screened for their ideology to make sure that they are in agreement with the business ethics and with the politics that are held by the donor. Those who meet these tests will then be allowed to administer the donor's fortune in precisely the manner in which the donor wishes. That's the first step. The second step is to have the foundation donate a portion of its income to charity. Now the charity, in case you haven't noticed, is very selective in most cases. Often it involves projects which generate profits for commercial enterprises which are controlled by the donor or the managers of the foundation. One example would be the funding of drug research for cancer, about which I have a little knowledge. The new drug eventually is approved, and profits flow to the pharmaceutical company which holds the patent for those drugs. The pharmaceutical company, in turn, will be within the control orbit of the donor or the foundation's managers. Now, this little operation is what John D. Rockefeller I often described as efficiency in philanthropy. Well, commercial gain is not the only motive for foundation funding. On many occasions, ideology plays an even more important role. 
Most of the great tax-exempt foundations are directed by outspoken internationalists, and they make no secret of their view that the United States should be humbled and downsized so it can be merged with other nations under a powerful world government. Oh yes, with themselves as part of the ruling class, of course. Now it should be no surprise that huge amounts of foundation grants are routinely given to those groups which in one way or another promote the dual program of humbling America and building world government. Now it's no accident that the tax-exempt foundations were created by the same people who created the income tax and the Federal Reserve. Now they did not make a mistake. All three schemes were conceived by the super-rich as mechanisms for harnessing the masses into service. Now not far behind the super-rich come the very rich. And although they didn't create the system, they do share in the spoils. Over the years, the tax laws have become twisted and turned into a Gordian knot of exemptions, deductions, depreciations, shelters, and credits. Now those with sufficient wealth can afford to hire professionals to trace these convoluted paths, but of course the common man must be contented with the crumbs of standard deductions and a so-called simplified tax return. Now it's difficult to imagine a tax that is more cumbersome and expensive to administer than the income tax. So that each individual's income can even be measured, taxpayers must document every aspect of their financial lives. In order to assure compliance, a virtual army of agents, auditors, and computer technicians are maintained at public expense. In the dust of this roving army are the hordes of camp followers the accountants and tax attorneys, all of whom consume massive chunks of the national wealth without producing anything except paperwork and procedures just to measure income. And in the process, every detail of our personal lives is recorded and made available to the bureaucracy. There is no man in America who understands the Internal Revenue Code. Agents of the IRS do not, judges do not, congressmen do not, and most assuredly taxpayers do not. There are over a thousand pages of technical language, much of which is vague or self-contradictory, giving rise to hundreds of thousands of pages of treasury rulings, court opinions, private letter rulings, and professional analysis. The Prentice Hall Federal Tax Library alone contains over 50 volumes with hundreds of new pages released each month, and yet the least educated person is expected to comply with its provisions because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Now, when one considers the complexity of the tax code and the astronomical expense of operating the IRS itself, it's obvious that every other tax that has ever been tried in history is easier to compute and more efficient to collect than the income tax. So why do we have it? Why not some other tax, any other tax than this? And the answer may surprise you. Raising revenue for the government is not the primary purpose of the income tax. The federal government could operate today, even at its present astronomical level of spending, without collecting any taxes whatsoever. In fact, much of the money it now spends is obtained that way. This is accomplished by a process called monetizing the debt, and it's done by the Federal Reserve System. The Fed, of course, is another topic, and if you think condensing a subject of tax reform is a tough one, you ought to try condensing the topic of the Federal Reserve System. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, it's too important to skip, so let me give that one a try with a sound bite. Now, this one will take exactly 16 seconds. Go. The Federal Reserve creates money out of nothing for the government and the banking cartel. This causes inflation and a loss of purchasing power. That loss becomes a hidden tax paid to the government and their partners in banking. It is the most insidious tax of all. That takes exactly 16 seconds if I read at the same rate I did before. But it's true. The federal government can use the tax called inflation to create all the money it needs through the Federal Reserve System. 
So why do we have an income tax? The answer was provided in the January 1946 issue of American Affairs, which carried an article written by Beardsley Rummel, who at that time was chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Now, Rummel had devised the system of automatic tax withholding during World War II, so he was well qualified to speak on the nature and the purpose of the income tax. And the article was, taxes for revenue are obsolete, which is what I just said. Now, Rummel explained exactly this when he referred this to the Federal Reserve System. He said that it can now create out of thin air all of the money the government could ever need. Therefore, he said, there are only two reasons to have taxes, and they have nothing to do with raising revenue. The first is to take money out of circulation, supposedly to combat inflation. Now, never mind that the Federal Reserve itself was causing inflation. The solution was not to cut back on the creation of money at the Fed, but to allow the working man to earn it and then take it back from him in taxes. The other purpose of taxation, according to Rummel, is to redistribute the wealth from one class of citizens to another. Now, this must always be done in the name of social justice or equality, of course. But the real objective is to override the free market and bring society under the control of the master planners. Now, here is how Rummel explained it. He said, the principal purpose of taxation is to attain more equality of wealth and of income than would result from economic forces working alone. The taxes which are effective for this purpose are the progressive individual income tax, the progressive estate tax, and the gift tax. These taxes should be defended and attacked in terms of their effect on the character of American life, not as revenue measures." End quote. And so I repeat, the purpose of the income tax is not to raise revenue for the government. It is to alter the character of American life. That is why we have it. Therefore, questions of tax simplicity or efficiency are of no consequence. The income tax code is complex because it is supposed to be complex. It is unfair because it is designed to be unfair. It cannot serve its primary purpose any other way. But now that we are in the reality zone, it becomes clear that the income tax can never be reformed. It will always be a tool for social engineering. Its heart and soul are favoritism. Its muscle is political power. Its nature is waste and corruption. The only way to reform the income tax is to get rid of it. Now, unfortunately, most of the plans for tax reform... <laughs> Jack says there's another 10 seconds. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, most of the plans for tax reform that have gained popularity over the past several decades have fallen far short of abolishing the income tax. The so-called tax reform bills produced by Congress have merely fiddled with the existing formulas for tax rates, deductions, exemptions, capital gains, and other factors which determine who gets to steal how much from everyone else. But abolish the tax together? <laughs> Heavens, that is an unthinkable thought. One of the currently popular plans for tax reform is called the flat tax. Now, supposedly everything will be wonderful if only everyone would pay exactly the same rate of tax. Now, admittedly, that would be a lot better than progressive tax brackets, which have the effect of punishing citizens for economic success. So what's wrong with the flat tax? Well, first of all, there's a word missing from the description. You may have noticed. The missing word is income. We are talking here about a flat income tax. Now, I suspect that word is omitted by its promoters because they don't want us to focus on the fact that this is still the same old income tax, merely dressed up with a different formula for tax rates. In other words, it's just the same old game they've been playing for decades, fiddling with the formulas. Will everyone actually pay the same rate of tax under this proposal? Well, not quite. The promoters tell us that there would still be an exemption for those under a certain income. Oh yes, a deduction for dependents. 
Oh, and old age, blindness, charity, medical bills, business losses, oil depletion, historic building restoration, and a thousand other tidbits that are so precious to the politicians who cater to special interest groups and who wish to restructure society. So it's not really a flat tax at all. Even its name is deceptive. But the biggest problem is that under this scheme, the income tax lives on. The IRS and its army of agents remain in force and fully operable. The camp followers of accountants and tax attorneys remain fully employed and financial privacy remains chained in the dungeon. All it would take is for Congress to discover some suitable fiscal emergency and the old formulas would be restored at the drop of a hat. We would be back where we are now faster than you can say deficit spending. Now another currently popular proposal for tax reform is to create a national sales tax. Now this proposal is more interesting because in its purest form at least it would completely replace the income tax. If it didn't of course it would be just another tax added on top of all the rest and no one in their right mind would endorse it, would they? On the face of it this proposal would appear to solve most of the problems associated with the present system. So there would be at least four benefits that I can see. One, it would reduce the cost of government by reducing the cost of collecting taxes. A new agency would be required to collect sales taxes from retail stores or possibly from the states which could merely add them on top of their own sales taxes. But the new agency would be very small compared to the gigantic structure of the IRS. Two, it would increase the productivity of the nation. The tax accountants and attorneys who now thrive in the income tax industry would have to find more productive uses for their talents. That would be a problem for some, but most of them would soon adapt their professional skills to pursuits associated with the production of goods and services. This would relieve American industry of the staggering accounting overhead of just documenting income and deductions. That would release a wave of human energy that could be redirected to the output of goods and services at lower prices, and that would cause a rise in the nation's standard of living. Three, investment decisions would now be made on the basis of economic merit rather than tax consequences. This would stimulate commercial ventures to greater levels of prosperity, cause higher yields on savings, create more jobs and better pay. That too would result in a higher standard of living for everyone. Four, the problem of financial privacy would be solved. Without the income tax, there would be no compelling interest for the government to know anything at all about our financial lives. Banks would no longer be required to report large financial transactions and what we did with our money would become no one's business but our own. Well, all of that sounds pretty impressive. Yet, I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I am not enthusiastic about this plan. Why not? Because we are dealing here with two proposals, not one, and we must keep them separate in our minds when analyzing their merits. The first is the elimination of the income tax, and the second is the creation of a national sales tax. All the benefits I have just mentioned flow from eliminating the income tax. None of them come from the creation of a national sales tax. As we shall see in a moment, a national sales tax, although it would solve some of the problems associated with the current system, would create new ones which are just as bad as the old. Now one of the problems that a national sales tax would not solve is the biggest problem of all, and that is the problem of the size of the tax. The best tax is not the simplest tax, nor the easiest tax to collect, nor even the fairest tax, it is the lowest tax. A simple tax that confiscates 65% of the productive output of the nation is far worse than a complex, inefficient, and unfairly distributed tax that takes only 5%. Today, the total bite is averaging about $8,500 per person per year. That's per person. It's much more per family. According to statistics published by the Tax Foundation, the average wage earner works from January 1st to May 7, the first 128 days of each year, just to pay taxes to federal, state, and local governments. That does not include the cost of compliance with the tax system, 
such as time in completing tax returns and hiring experts for guidance. If those are included, add another 13 days. For the effect of that hidden tax called inflation, add another eight days, and the total is 149 days, or five months out of each year. But that's not the end of it. In all the debates regarding tax reform, there is seldom a word about the biggest tax of all, the Social Security tax. For each dollar paid by an employee, the employer pays another one, so the total size of the tax is two times what it appears to be on the paycheck. Now then there's the effect of taxes embedded in everything we buy. In a dozen eggs, for example, there are at least 100 taxes paid before they reach the market, and these are included in the bill. Over 600 taxes on a house. They include transportation taxes, excise taxes, telephone taxes, property taxes, inventory taxes, license taxes, inspection fees, permits, and many others. When all of these are added together, government at all levels is now taking more than half of the total production of the American people. Now, I submit, ladies and gentlemen, that any proposal for tax reform that fails to deal with this monstrous reality is hot air at best and a scam at worst. The size of the tax is more important than the formula by which the tax is collected. Now, that does not mean the formula is unimportant because some formulas are worse than others. But it does mean that any realistic proposal for tax reform must include some provision which can limit the size of the government itself, which is the only way to limit the size of the tax. The national sales tax proposal has no such provision. In fact, it would provide a very workable mechanism for government to continue exactly on its present course. So what's the answer? What kind of tax could accomplish the seemingly impossible task of limiting the size of government? Well, I have some good news for you. There is a tax that was designed to accomplish exactly the goal we seek. Furthermore, this tax is not just a theory. It already has been tested in America and found to be entirely workable. Where is this plan to be found? It's hidden in the place where it's most unlikely to be discovered by Congress. It's in the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> now, one of the most urgent matters taken up by our founding fathers at the Constitutional Convention was how to establish a tax system which would not become onerous to the people. It was a burning issue that consumed the delegates for many months. One of the concerns was that the new tax must act equally on the majority as well as the minority. In other words, if farmers would find themselves in voting control of Congress, they must not be allowed to shift the tax burden to people in the cities. And those states with greater population must not be allowed to shift taxes to those with smaller population. Regardless of which citizens might find themselves in the majority, they must not be allowed to tax others in any way beyond what they tax themselves. There was unanimous agreement on that principle. The second principle was an outgrowth of the concept of no taxation without representation. They just fought a war to establish that point. If we pay taxes, then we must have representation. Conversely, if we have representation, then we must pay taxes. That's the other half of the equation. And since the purpose of representation is to control taxation, it follows that no one should have a voice in taxation who is not paying those taxes. In Massachusetts, even prior to the revolution, there had been a public uproar over the occasional election of ministers because they didn't pay taxes. It was understood that all citizens were entitled to equal protection under the law, but only those who paid taxes were to be entitled to vote. Now, the tax plan that emerged from the Constitutional Convention was brilliant. Nothing like it had ever been proposed before or since. It was never given a formal name, but for our purposes, let's call it the Uniform Apportionment Tax, and the reason will become clear in a moment. The delegates to the convention made reference to two kinds of taxes, direct and indirect. These words were not defined in the Constitution, which was an oversight and would assume major proportions in the following years. But it's clear from the debates and essays leading to ratification that the delegates shared a common understanding of these words. It was the same meaning that we find in the 1933 edition of Black's Law Dictionary. And this is it. A direct tax is one which is paid by the person who is the intended ultimate taxpayer. It is a direct tax because he pays it directly to the tax collector. 
An indirect tax is one which is passed on to the ultimate taxpayer in the form of a higher price for something he buys. It is an indirect tax because he pays it indirectly to the tax collector. Examples of a direct tax are property taxes and per capita taxes, which are paid by the ultimate taxpayer directly to the tax collector. Examples of indirect taxes are import taxes and excise taxes, which are paid for by the ultimate taxpayer indirectly as a part of his price for goods and services. Now, direct taxes were viewed by the founding fathers as dangerous because they give government great power over its citizens. And also because in order to measure these taxes, government agents must have the authority to snoop around the private property and into the personal lives of all citizens. They agreed, therefore, that direct taxes are safer if administered by the states where elected representatives are closer to the people and government is easier to control. Indirect taxes, on the other hand, were viewed as less dangerous because people could avoid them entirely if they wanted, merely by not purchasing the items being taxed. The assumption in those days was that the indirect taxes would be leveled only on items considered to be non-essential, such as liquor and tobacco. And also the process of collecting indirect taxes does not violate the right of privacy. So for these reasons, the delegates agreed that the federal government should be limited to indirect taxes only. Now, with all that background in mind, now we're ready to look at the uniform apportionment tax. It consists of two provisions. One, the federal government shall derive its primary revenue from indirect taxes, and these shall be uniform in all states. Two, in the event of war or similar emergencies, the federal government, with the consent of Congress, may levy direct taxes passed through, as they called it, passed through the states to the citizens of the states. This tax, however, must be proportional to the number of representatives that each state has in Congress. This process is called apportionment. And so, in other words, if there were 100 representatives in Congress and the state of Virginia had seven of them, the voters in Virginia would have to pay 7% of the direct tax. Now, the merit of this tax cannot be appreciated merely by studying these rather dull rules. It's to be found in the philosophy behind the rules. The purpose of apportionment was to limit the power of the central government. Direct taxation through apportionment was to be used only to pay for war or other great emergencies. It was viewed as an extreme measure and not intended for the day-to-day -day operation of the federal government. That function was to be financed by indirect taxes alone. Furthermore, the procedure for levying a direct tax was made deliberately cumbersome. Congress was required to do things that no government really wants to do. For one thing, it had to justify its tax before collecting it. Now, each direct tax becomes a separate project and must be written into a revenue act. The purpose and the amount of the tax must be stated, it then must be publicly debated and voted upon. And when the tax is collected, the revenue act expires and the door to more money is closed. Well, how different that is from the ongoing power of general taxation, under which the purpose is seldom known, the amount is always in doubt, and the process is endless. The rule of apportionment was the greatest restraint on the power and reach of government that had yet been devised by man, and it's little wonder that it became a thorn in the side of federal politicians in the years to follow. Now, the federal government operated for many decades entirely on revenues raised through the uniform apportionment tax. Most of the money came from import duties on goods from other countries, and when excise taxes on domestic items were added to the list at a later date, there was a great uproar of opposition, and those taxes were eventually repealed. Now, between 1789 and 1861, the federal government levied a direct tax in accordance with the rule of apportionment four times, and each time it worked exactly as the founders had planned. The first was to pay off the national debt incurred by the Revolutionary War. The second and the third was to pay for the War of 1812. The fourth was to help pay for the war between the states. And in all cases, Congress had stated the purpose and the amount. The measure had been debated and passed. Once collected, the taxes expired, 
and the federal government return to its rigid budget of revenue from import duties alone. Now, the first part of the 19th century was a period of great growth and prosperity for the United States. The central government was weak regarding internal affairs as it was intended to be. The bureaucracy stayed out of the way and let Americans get on with their lives. Commerce flourished, wealth was created, the standard of living for the common man soared. Then, with the advent of the war between the states, the long retreat from greatness began. In 1864, Congress became impatient with the uniform apportionment tax and enacted the nation's first income tax, which, according to the framers of the Constitution, is a direct tax. They charged this tax directly to the citizens of each state, but ignored the rule of apportionment. In other words, they violated the Constitution. However, to make it appear otherwise, they added a phrase in the new law that referred to the income tax as an excise tax. Well, everyone knew that excise taxes are indirect taxes, so that settled that. Presto changeo. By political decree, a direct tax became an indirect tax by merely changing its name. Well, fortunately, the tax had been presented as a temporary emergency measure, and it expired in 1872 but it was the beginning of the end. By that time, the theories of Karl Marx were sweeping through the intellectual and educational institutions of America, and the populist movement was capturing political power. Politicians dreamed of a permanent income tax because of the bountiful stream of revenue that would follow from it. The masses were also fascinated by its progressive or graduated feature because it gave expression to their envy of the rich. In 1894, Congress was firmly on the populist bandwagon and passed the nation's second income tax law, which was promptly declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, which said a direct tax is still a direct tax, regardless of what Congress may call it. The matter was far from resolved. Populist sentiments continued to grow and gain political converts. By 1909, the Republicans had taken up the banner for the income tax and proposed the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which was designed to take the matter out of the hands of the Supreme Court. The amendment was ratified in 1913, and it has been with us ever since. Well, enough of the history. What we're going to do about the tax today, let's start with the negatives. We do not need a flat income tax, which merely would be one more useless attempt at fiddling with the formula for favoritism. We do not need a national sales tax, which fails to put any restrictions on the size and reach of government. Theoretically, indirect taxes could include a national sales tax, but that would be a huge mistake, in my opinion, because it would keep the door open to a limitless stream of ongoing revenue. It would be far better to adhere to the plan of the Founding Fathers, who levied the indirect taxes only on imported items and those that are not necessities. The idea of a sales tax across the board on everything we consume would cause them to turn over in their graves. Now, what we do need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is follow the greatest proposal for tax reform the world has ever seen. Under the Uniform Apportionment Tax, if Congress exceeded its budget, it would have to make a request for a specific amount, for a specific purpose, and on a specific date. And then it would have to explain to the voters why this is necessary. It's difficult to imagine a more effective plan for trimming the size and the reach of the federal bureaucracy. Repealing the 16th Amendment would accomplish everything the current proposals for tax reform claim to seek. For the first time since 1913, the federal government would have to prepare a realistic budget because it would no longer be able to rely on an ongoing, limitless supply of revenue. But even that will not be enough. No realistic plan would be complete without also abolishing the Federal Reserve System. We must remember that this is the source of the hidden tax called inflation. And as long as it is allowed to stand, true tax reform will never be possible. Now, for many people, the knee-jerk reaction to this proposal is the question, but where would the money come from to run the government? And that question presupposes that all the money the federal government now spends is necessary. 
The reality is that if we were to cut out the waste, subsidies, foreign giveaways, transfer programs, interest on the national debt, transfusions into the International Monetary Fund, and support of the World Bank, plus the cost of running the IRS itself, the federal government could easily operate as it was intended to do on the indirect taxes it now collects. And so in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I will summarize the second half of this presentation in exactly five seconds. And here it is. If you are serious about tax reform, the uniform apportionment tax is the only game in town. Thank you very much. This program is from the audio archives of the Reality Zone. For more information, visit our website at www.realityzone.com or call our toll-free number 800-595 Six five nine six. That number again is eight hundred five nine five six five nine six. The Reality Zone is a subsidiary of American Media.